Greetings and welcome to the module on materials descriptors for data science. I'm Alejandro Strachan, Professor of Materials Engineering at Purdue University. This module is a part of a series uh, that aims to introduce data science in the context of engineering and science applications. And in this module, we will learn how to enhance our data using descriptors. We will also learn how to analyze these descriptors using uh, correlations. Uh, this is a hands-on module. So on top of this lecture, we have a hands-on tutorial where you will be able to use online simulations in NanoHub to test and play with the ideas we will discuss. And there's a homework assignment that will allow you to go deeper into these topics and be able to modify the workflows that are available in NanoHub to fit your needs. So in terms of uh, the learning objectives I mentioned, we will learn that uh, uh, different ways of uh, using descriptors. We can do simple periodic table-based descriptors, but also uh, use uh, properties either from a physics-based calculation or a model. And uh, we will learn that descriptors is a way in which we can infuse domain knowledge into a data science effort. The uh, prerequisites are really minimal. We will be the hands-on part. We'll use Python on Jupyter Notebooks in NanoHub. So basic programming skills are needed, but you by no mean, means need to be an expert in coding to go through this exercise. So what is data science? Data science is learning from data. By example, without necessarily knowing the underlying laws that govern the, the problem at hand or the, the physics in the case of material science. So there are several steps in a, uh, a data science workflow. Of course, you need to start by acquiring data and pre-analyzing this data. Uh, once you have your data, you can develop predictive models. You may be interested in predicting a, a property of a material, for example, that's called supervised learning. We have a module uh, on that. And uh, data science can also allow you to find patterns in your data where you're not interested in predicting a property. You're just trying to understand the underlying structure of your data. and an area that's very exciting, and we also have a module devoted to this, is using data science for design of experiments, well, where you combine the knowledge, uh, the existing knowledge, and you use data science to predict what is the next experiment, experiment that you should do uh, towards your design goal uh, for, to discover a new material or optimize a material. And all of these uh, efforts in data science uh, it would not be um, would really not be doable without a powerful cyber infrastructure for data and models. So we need lots of data to be able to do data science, and that means that we need to uh, uh, the community needs to share the data. The data needs to be discoverable and available online, and we also have a module devoted to that, what we call fair uh, data principles. Um, and throughout the series, we uh, use and introduce a set of infrastructure, infrastructures for data and also for models. And we will use NanoHub online simulation for our hands-on activities in this module. So let's jump to it. Uh, we're going to discuss descriptors uh, for data science workflows. As I mentioned, machine learning is learning from data by example. So the idea is you have an output that you're interested in predicting, and you have raw data that describes, say, the material that leads to that output. So if you have lots of examples of input data and output, input and output, input and output, 
you can train a neural network that, uh, or, or other models. Neural networks are not the only models, uh, but neural networks are known as universal approximators. And that means that if you have lots of data and there's a relationship between the input data and the output, the neural network can be trained to map those inputs into the outputs. Again, if you have lots of data, then you can tease out this relationship. And uh, you probably all know that machine learning is used not just in engineering applications, but in many other fields, in marketing, in commerce, um, to make recommendations uh, for what book you should read next or what movie you should watch next. Um, so in um, so let's talk about this, this subset of machine learning that's called deep learning. And in deep learning, uh, the idea is you have lots of data that relate the examples relating the raw data and the output. And if you create a large neural network, a deep neural network with lots of adjustable parameters, uh, because neural networks are universal approximators, you will be able to find the mapping between raw data and output. This is a very powerful technique, but it requires lots of data. And we're going to see how uh, many data points you need in, in, in a minute, at least for one example. Um, and so uh, now what the network needs to do is learn this mapping. So let's think about what it would take to learn the mapping in an example from material science. Let's say I'm interested in predicting the strength of a metallic alloy. And so my raw data would be the composition of the material, but we know composition alone doesn't fully determine the properties of the material. I need to know how that material was processed and whether there's been any uh, heat treatment or post-processing that the material was subject to. So let's say I have that input and uh, this, I want to predict the strength. Well, uh, if you're familiar with material science, you know that there's many mechanisms that strengthen a metallic alloy. And the neural network will have to abstract all of these processes to be able to relate composition, processing, and heat treatment to strength. So let's talk a little bit about that. We know that Strength is governed by, as I said, lots of processes. Solid solution strengthening, if you have a solid solution, if you have solid atoms, they hinder the mobility of these locations that provide strength. Um, if you have interfaces, grain boundaries or interfaces between phases, that also hinders the mobility of these locations and provides strength. And if you cold work a material, if you deform the material, you increase the density of these locations, and these dislocations also get in each other's ways, providing strengthening. Now, these processes depend in turn on many other aspects of the material. Uh, for example, what I need to know what presence, what faces are present. I need to know the grain size so I can understand hull patch and interfacial strength strengthening and also this location density. Uh, these, in turn, depend on the phase diagram and kinetics, uh, recrystallization temperature, hardening law. So you can imagine that uh, the, uh, this is a gigantic task. The neural network will have to uh, have different levels of abstractions to be able to tease out all of these processes if we want to predict strength. This is possible. And that's how, for example, uh, image recognition works with different level of abstractions where you find corners and lines and things like that, and then they put them together, uh, and then you can detect whether this is a cat or, or a dog. Uh, so in, in material science, this is also possible. But you can imagine that this, in order to learn all of this by example, this really requires a lot of data. And often, uh, we don't have a lot of data. So one would be hard-pressed 
to think that with relatively uh, small amounts of data, the network could be trained to learn all of these very complex relationships. So what do we do about, uh, what can we do about that? And so the one of the uh, possible uh, approaches when you don't have a, a, a enormous amounts of data is to use descriptors. And so the descriptors can simplify, uh, make the, the life of the neural network easier. So for example, what if I characterize my material and I, I measure the microstructure and I add the microstructure as an input to the neural network? Then that means that I don't have to learn kinetics, and uh, how grain growth, uh, recrystallization temperature, because I have the output of all of those. What if I do XRD and I can figure out from the XRD patterns uh, the density of this location? So uh, if I add this type of physics-based or, or domain-inspired descriptors, I, I have to learn fewer things. And if I have to learn fewer things, I can use a smaller model, a neural network that's not as deep, that has fewer uh, trainable parameters. And also, uh, I can get away with uh, 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 fewer data points, okay? So that's, the, that's what we're going to see, and we're going to see an interesting example of how you can improve the accuracy of a model uh, by adding better and better descriptors. Um, so let's uh, move on. So just to summarize, if I have raw data and an output, deep learning just connects the raw data with an output that requires a lot of an, a lot of data. Uh, with descriptors, we take kind of a, a well, I was going to say a shortcut. This doesn't look like a shortcut, but uh, we from the raw data, we compute descriptors. And from the descriptors, we can use, instead of deep learning, we would call it machine learning. It's simpler models, same idea, but simpler models to relate to the output. And we can infuse physics into our workflow. So this is an example of work out of Northwestern uh, University, where they, they were interested in predicting uh, cohesive energy, some, some kind of property, and they are comparing different approaches, okay? So what if I use just out of the box random force, this is not deep learning, okay? This will be simple machine learning, using raw data. And what we're plotting is the mean absolute error, okay, how, how good uh, accuracy of our model, as a function of the size of the training set, okay? So this is using very straightforward, simple model, no descriptors. And you can see that things get better as you have more and more data, you train your model better. Uh, but you can do a whole, lot, a whole lot better by training the random force with physics-based descriptors, okay? This is what we're going to focus on today. Uh, how you can get better accuracy by adding descriptors. Now, what this paper found was that LMNet, which is deep learning, uh, without descriptors, just a composition, but a deep learning. So you can learn all of these different, you have a, a flexible enough model that can perform all of these levels of abstractions to, un to try to understand the physics. Uh, deep learning, if you have little data, if you don't have a lot of data, this is a thousand data points, okay? If you have fewer uh, scarce data, deep learning is not very good. It cannot really tease out all of these relationships. Now, there's a point in which deep learning, if you have lots of data, and in this particular example, it's about 4,000 or so data points, uh, can outperform uh, a standard machine learning with physics-based descriptors, okay? So this is always something that you want to keep in mind. Um, but uh, so the, the, the focus of this lecture is how to embed descriptors and physics into a relatively simple 
uh, machine learning exercise without going deep learning. So the simplest way, the simplest type of descriptors you can imagine are things that can be easily uh, calculated from the composition of the material. So if I know composition, there's a bunch of things I can do. I can look at the periodic table and look at the electronic structure of the atoms involved. I can see the, ion, the ionic radius of the atoms, Th those type of properties. Um, uh, the electronegativity that might tell me whether uh, the atoms are making strong ionic bonds or not. You can, you can think how, you can imagine how putting this type of information uh, can provide key insight to the model, uh, depending on what you want to predict. And so there are many uh, libraries and, and codes that simplify these calculations, and that's what we will use in our example. And so what I'm going to do next is show you an example. And this is the example that you will be able to work on in the hands-on parts of the module. Uh, so in this example, we'd like to predict the melting temperature of oxides. And uh, this, we developed this tool in NanoHub that you can find here. It's called Feature Select. And you will run it online. You don't have to download any software. All you need is a free NanoHub account. And, um, and so the goal is to predict the melting temperature of these oxides. And we're going to go through a series of uh, more and more sophisticated descriptors and see how we improve the accuracy of the models along the way. These models, the models that we're going to use are random forest not neural networks. Um, we do have a module on neural networks if you're interested in, and the results would more or less apply to neural networks uh, as well. So a random forest is a trainable physics agnostic model that is created as an ensemble of decision trees. So let's discuss what a decision tree is. So uh, with, with our example, let's say I want to predict the melting temperature and I have a descriptor of my material, that's the ionic packing frequency, how uh, closely packed the atoms are in the crystal. So, and you can imagine that uh, more highly packed systems will have a, a melting temperature. So this data is made up, but let's assume that your, your, this is the relationship. What a, run, what a decision tree does is it breaks the space, the input space into segments, and it assigns a constant value to that particular segment, okay? So a piecewise constant function and discrete jumps in the segment. So you could say if the ionic packing fra fraction is less than 0.5, the melting temperature is 500, else if it's from 0.5 to 0.57, uh, it's 1,000. It fits more than 60, uh, 0.62 is 2,000, okay? Now, you can imagine that this would not be a very accurate model, but random forests, what they do is they create an ensemble of decision trees and average the output. So your, your input data is not one dimensional. You have lots of input data. If you want to predict the melting temperature, you might know the density, ionic packing fraction, some other descriptors that we will discuss later. And what you do is you create a bunch of these trees, okay? And by the way, I have four here and very narrow, very uh, not deep, very shallow trees. In reality, you have lots of trees, trees that are very deep, and what you do is you train each individual trees with a, uh, a random subset of the data and also with a random su subset of the features, okay? So not all trees see the same amount of data or the same amount of the same uh, types of descriptors. And so these trees make their decisions. They're completely independent, not completely independent, but they make their decisions independent of each other. And then the output is the average of all of these trees. 
that's what that's what uh, Random Forest did. So I'm going to show you a little bit of the code that you will see in the hands-on exercises here, and uh, and I'll walk you through to show you the example. I'll walk you through the code. Okay. So the first thing you will do when you do the hands-on exercise is you're going to create arrays with the input and the output data that's already preloaded in the tool. Uh, as always, or as it's off, uh, commonly done in, in machine learning, we're going to normalize the data, uh, the input data, so we don't have values. We get rid of units. We don't have values that are 10 to the 25 and values that are 0 0.5. And, um, and we, you, you will be able to see our input array that has 157 uh, examples. These are different materials with melting temperatures uh, by four. And four are this initial set of very simple descriptors that we will use. We will train a random forest. And these are the properties that we will do, we will use first. Ionic packing fraction, density, the space group to know about the crystal structure, and the molar volume. And we will, you will learn how to set up a very simple um, random forest, few lines of code, and train this random forest with, with your data. And once, once you train it, you can see we actually do it multiple times, and we do averages. But this is one of the random forests. And this is a parity plot. Uh, so what we're comparing is the prediction versus the actual real value of the melting temperature. Um, a perfect model would lie on this line, right? The, the, the line with slope one. So here, the blue dots is the training set, the data that the, uh, the, the, the model actually saw during training, and the red points are the testing set. And the testing set is not used for training at all. So the, the red dots really are uh, indicate the accuracy of the model to make a prediction for a material that it has not seen before. You can see that the model is not awful. It does capture some correlations. Random forests uh, have a way of assessing their accuracy, the accuracy of their predictions. You can see that the if you consider the mean value plus the uh, the uh, uncertainty, the predicted uncertainty, it, it does pretty well, but it's not perfect, okay? And if you look at the data, you're going to make, we're going to make an error, a, a mean absolute error in the prediction of about 500 Kelvin, okay? Uh, which is not awesome. So can we do better with the script? So the first thing we will do is use descriptors based on the periodic table. And the code, the hands-on part, shows you line by line how you do that. And because we have these libraries uh, available that I mentioned, like Magpie and a bunch of other uh, libraries, uh, creating these descriptors is relatively easy. So we have a list here of the periodic table properties that we can select from. And we also have a way of combining them to have a descriptor of our alloy. So for example, you can do the average of the, electro the electronegativity of all the elements involved in the material. But of course, in terms of electronegativity, you don't care about the average. Mostly we care about the difference to know whether there's ionic bonding. So we do average, mean, minus, max, uh, standard deviation. You can do different things to create descriptors for your material based on periodic table data. So we do that. We give that as input to the random forest. And you can see just visually that our model gets better. And uh, in this example, what we see is from 500, we go down to 360 Kelvin, much better, with very little data, just being smart about saying, okay, I think certain properties should matter. I can calculate these properties very easily. Um, next, 
the, the, the last step in adding physics into the description is adding physics-based either calculations or models. Um, if, if you know about materials, you, you know that uh, melting has to do with the strength of the bond. Now, mel melting, computing theoretically or experimentally, melting temperature is actually very hard. But uh, there's another property that's the stiffness, the elastic constants of a material that also depend on the strength of the bond and you would expect them to be related. So what, in our last step, we're going to add elastic constants of the material and we're going to add elastic constants that are calculated from ab initio simulations using density functional theory. These are predictive physics-based simulations. They're relatively easy to compute and they're very accurate. As I said, melting temperature cannot be done uh, easily at all. And so we're going to use this physics-based simulation as input, the elastic constants. We're going to use the bulk modulus and the shear modulus. And also, at the same time, uh, there's a classic uh, melting law by uh, Lindemann from the early 1900s that allows you, that uses a physics-based model to predict the melting temperature. I'm not going to go into the details of this expression. It has to do with the divide temperature, but um, you can add it. And you can see that the the Lindemann temperature alone is not super awesome either. The Lindemann prediction of the melting temperatures, it's okay, it captures some of the physics, but the mean absolute error is 426. So Lindemann, without machine learning, with his knowledge of materials, was able to create a very good model, but it's certainly not perfect. Now, if we add the Lindemann prediction as an input. This is something that can be calculated very easily. As an input to our machine learning model, then now our accuracy for the machine learning is much better, 290 degrees Kelvin. So we went from 500 to 290. We cut down the error by a factor of two just by thinking about the problem and using descriptors that made sense, that makes sense based on our domain knowledge. And so this is very powerful. So what are good descriptors and what are bad descriptors? Uh, ideally, you'd like your descriptor, first of all, it needs to be very easy to calculate or compute. And it should correlate very strongly with the output. If you put a descriptor that say the color of the material, or the day of the week in which the material was synthesized, of course, that's not going to help you. Uh, and so that now you have multiple descriptors. You want the descriptors to correlate strongly with the material, and you want different descriptors to add complementary information, not the same information. So you would like to add descriptors that are not strongly correlated with each other. Okay. So if you put a descriptor that's the bulk modulus, and then the bulk modulus divided by two, Obviously, that doesn't help anyone. And so a way of uh, assessing uh, these descriptors is by what's called Pearson correlation. It's linear correlation between properties. And this is the mathematical definition of Pearson correlation. And so let's say X and Y are two descriptors or a descriptor and the output property. What you do is you calculate the expectation value for material over material, you know, a data, a data point at a time of the value of the descriptor X minus its mean value. So how much the, the, the descriptor, let's say bulk modulus goes up and down from its mean uh, versus how the other property Y also goes up or down from the mean. So if you have two properties, they could have very different means but if both of them go up for the same materials and go down for the same materials, right? So the first part and the second part, they tend to be positive for the same materials and negative for the, for the same material. You can see that the product is also going to be, always going to be positive. 
So when I do the average, the expectation value of that, this, those deviations correlate positively. You get a positive number. If the numbers are completely uncorrelated, then the first parentheses and the second parentheses are going to be positive and negative randomly. Their product is going to be sometimes positive, sometimes negative, and you're going to get something that's essentially zero. The, the properties could also be negatively correlated, but that's very valuable. So some property might go up, uh, and uh, at the same time, the other property goes down. So in that case, this the product is going to be tend to be almost always negative, and the average is going to be negative. So that means that when property X goes up, the property Y goes down, but that's also very useful. They're correlated. They're just negatively correlated. So this is the example of uh, that you're also going to see in the hands-on section of uh, calculating these Pearson correlations for a subset of your descriptors. And so the, the way you visualize this often is with a uh, like a uh, matrix type form and in this particular case, blue tends to be negative correlations, and red is a strong positive correlation. Every property, these are all input properties. The last one is melting temperature. Every property, of course, is perfectly correlated with itself, so the diagonal is one. But then we can see how the different properties correlate with the melting temperature, okay? so. Um, this is ionic packing fraction, positive correlation. So materials that are packed more tightly tend to have higher melting temperatures. Density two, denser materials tend to have a melting temperature. The correlation is not super strong though. Space group matters. Molar volume uh, is negatively correlated. This means that materials that have big volume, so low density, tend to have lower temperature. Now, Look at this shear modulus, bulk modulus. Those are very strongly correlated. That's why when we add in this descriptor, our error went down significantly. Lindemann melting temperature, that's the strongest correlation, 0.8. Okay, so Lindemann was right a century ago. And so this explains why adding these type of descriptors improves the models so much, okay? All right, so in summary, um, we all know data science, machine learning is becoming widely used more and more in uh, engineering and science fields. And descriptors uh, can play a key role in lots of applications where the data is scarce, where we don't have thousands and thousands or hundreds of thousands of data points. Um, now, the, and the descriptor sees a way in which we as domain experts can em, em, embed domain knowledge into uh, machine learning. Of course, descriptors uh, need to be easy to calculate, right? If the descriptor is harder to calculate or obtain than the quantity of interest, then you might as well just go and calculate the quantity of interest. Um, and uh, the design of descriptors is not an art, but it certainly requires domain knowledge. And there's ways in which you can assess how, how good or bad your descriptors are. Um, and in the hands-on section, we will introduce you to several libraries that you can use to very easily compute these periodic table-based descriptors for materials or similar things for chemistry. Um, with this, I invite you to go through the hands-on exercises, uh, the hands-on tutorial and the homework. And uh, I thank you for your attention.